we're going to chair tonight's meeting, and obviously something has occurred that's delayed him, so I'm going to stand in for him. Uh, my name is Cynthia Derry, and I'm one of the parish councillors who uh, had raised this issue and uh, was concerned to have a meeting. So um, we, they planned for the evening, uh, could really have time to come along to do a kind of presentation for us about the shale gas extraction. And I know there are some very knowledgeable people in the room from various organisations. We have a couple of guests from the Environment Agency, welcome, and people from the River Estuary Gas Tracking Group, who have obviously been doing a lot of homework, so they're very knowledgeable people too. Um, and I wouldn't like to hazard a guess at all the other sources of knowledge. So um, it's an evening for sharing information, for asking questions, I'm getting a, trying to get a good understanding of what the issues are, and I hope we can do it and proceed in that, uh, uh, that manner. Um, so can I introduce uh, Paul Matish, um, who is Head of Well Services, and he's going to do the presentation to start with up tonight uh, for three months. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I've got a, a brief presentation for you all, just to give you an idea and an insight into who we are and what we're actually doing. It's a fairly brief presentation, but it gives you a, a good indication of our operation. So what I'll do is, if it's okay with everybody, we'll go through the presentation, and if we've got any questions at the end of it, we can answer and help any questions we've got from there. So, uh, so first of all, basically we're here to say who we are, what we do, what is hydraulic fracturing, public concerns of oil and gas activity, economic, Im economic impact of our development, <coughs> energy use, and community relations. These are just some basic topics that we want to present to you tonight. A little bit about Quadrilla. Quadrilla is a UK company. We have a, a multinational workforce within there, and we brought a lot of expertise from lots of different areas throughout the world for this particular project. So, we're actually based in Litchfield in Staffordshire, that is our head office. We have 74 full-time workforce and 51, 51 from the UK, so it's, it's a decent sized small company with a, like I say, with a multinational task force and a workforce in there. The licenses for the drilling are actually approved by the Department of Energy and Climate Change to explore, and the drilling must occur within a five year period. That's our time scale for this work. We have temporary variation from the Lancashire County Council. An exploration well is drilled and tested. That is the first part of the process. We must come to site, drill the well to evaluate what we have at the location. This whole process is going through an exploratory stage, so we're at the very early stages of our development within this project. We are here to assess the commercial viability. What, is, what, what gas is in place? What quantity, what volume, is it economically viable to be able to produce to make it saleable? So this, this is all part of the exploration process. To present, we've actually drilled three wells. Our first well was Priest Hall, our second well was Grange Hill, and the third well that we've just completed before Christmas was at Beckinsall. We've actually got another well which is in the pipeline at the moment, but that's going through the planning stage, but that will, will come to that eventually. Now the company is such as what we call a vertically integrated company. We, are, we don't go to the market and contract a lot of work, work in from other companies and equipment and specialist expertise. We've developed the company to try and be as self-sufficient as possible. So we have all of our own equipment, we run all of our own services. We do rely on some third party companies for support within our operations. But that is the termination of a vertically inter integrated company. We, assess and we have all of our own equipment and we carry out all of our own operations. Now the picture that you can see here, we have two options. Once we can prove that is the gas sufficient to, on the location to be able to, uh, to make it commercially viable. The two options are we can export the gas into one of the main pipelines which runs through the area which is three main pipelines and the second option is that we can bring the gas to the surface and we can actually use that gas to run gas generators on the surface and that then turns into electric generators electricity which goes into the national grid. And the, the view that you can see here is a typical example of what a production site will look like. Very simple, straightforward location, very low profile, unobtrusive. So that is a good idea of exactly how one of our locations would look like. 
The work that we do is regulated by the number of organisations. We work very closely with DEP. They approve everything that we do. Every time we, we drill a well or we do a, a process, we go to an independent well examiner for approval. We work very closely and obviously we have to have permission with the Lancashire County Council. The environmental agency, we work very close with them at all times because we, they monitor what we do. They do regular inspections, so we have a close working relationship uh, with that organisation. And of course the health and safety executive. Again, everything that we do has to be monitored and reviewed by the HSE and submitted as part of the planning and the development process. Hydraulic fracturing, it's something that everybody's talking about and <coughs> it's been around for a long time. This is not a new process, this is not something that has just suddenly come to the UK. This has been around in the UK for 20 years, 20, 20 plus years. In the UK there's been actually over 200 wells fracked. And this is the information which you can actually get from the Department of Energy. Elswick 1, which is our production site, which is north of here, that was fracked 20 year, 22 years ago, and it's been a producing gas, gas site ever since. So it is a very it's established process that's been in place for a long time. The picture that you can see here, this was fracked in Cheshire in 1992. Actually, Eric was very instrumental in uh, working on this project, so he's got a lot of knowledge of working in the UK as well as many other people in the, in the organisation. So, fracking was actually developed commercially back in 1940. So this is a very old process. It basically works on moving fluid with pressure into, into, the, into the well for the formations. Once, what we do is we pump water and we pump sand in, it goes through into the formations and once we've done the fraction, we allow it to relax and come back to the surface, we remove the water. So the, after the pumping stops, the fraction held open for the propent, which is the sand, to go into the, into the fractured formations. The chemicals that we use, they're additives to the water. And these, I'll go into some of these a little bit further along the line, but basically the water goes in, all of the water that we purchase comes from United Utilities, it's drinking water. So it is, it is pure. When we prepare a site before we bring the rig or any equipment to the location, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort going to looking after the site, making sure that it is sealed. The picture that you see up there, this is before the rig or any other equipment comes to the site. The whole area of it is excavated, it's cleaned, it's leveled. We put a membrane on of uh, a visqueen and then we put a rubber line all the way across the site. So this is completely sealed, the full location across the ground, up the embankments, all areas. And this is designed to contain if we ever we have a spillage of, if a, if a delivery driver came and he spilled some days or he spilled some oil, it's contained within that location and any, any fluid that could get accidentally spilled in there comes across to the edge of this, this bump that we have here. This water containment area goes around the location so if anything is spilt, it is contained within here and then it is removed and disposed of so no fluid can leave the site without it being controlled. Around our locations, we have installed gas monitoring and this allows us to take background readings. Is there any gas in the, in the formation of the start? Is there anything coming to surface? So it allows us to see what we've got before we come to site, during and after the operation. So that's a constant monitoring system that we have there. Okay, this is a little bit about the well bore design and probably a number of you have had various amounts of information with regards to this. This shows the well bore that we actually use. We have a very robust casing system in here whereby we'll drill from the surface, the top section that we will drill there, we'll set 13 and 3 8 casing. We'll drill down to a depth, we'll clean it out, we'll run steel casing into the ground and then we cement that all the way back up. So we've got steel and then we've got cement set into the ground. The intermediate section that we will drill next, which will be 12 and a quarter, we drill down through the middle of the 13 and 5 eighths, we run steel tube again, casing within inside of the first set, and we cement that back, back up on, on around the outside. And then we come to the final section, which will drill 8.5 inch hole, and then we'll set 5.5 inch steel casing into the ground again, We'll put cement through the middle of it and cement all the way back up. 
So we've got three steel barriers and three layers of cement all the way around the whole location, <coughs> around the well bore. So we've got a lot of integrity within that. The reason for this is that we, we must protect, it, protect any aquifers and we have a policy that where we come to a location and beforehand we know where there's an aquifer, we will always go at least 500 feet past any aquifer. So we've got a lot of containment, uh, way past what the required uh, level in the, in the US is from years ago, so we, we've got a very robust system here. The frac fluid. Okay, now this is, this is the fluid that we pump with our main, main pumps. Once we've drilled the well, the rig will then move away. So the rig will move away and then we've got the well, which is steel cased and cemented, but sealed at this particular point. The fracking is designed to go through the casing and it, and it will then go into the formations that we're, that we're interested in. So the fluid that we, that we run with, like I say, is pure water. And the only additives that we use are a polyacrylamide, which is called a friction, friction reducer. Because we're pumping a high velocity of fluid through a fairly small tube, by adding a friction reducer, it makes the water more slippery. It, it allows it to flow faster. So it actually helps the pumping system, rather than trying to force it down, putting this friction reducer in there, allows the fluid to flow a lot easier, so it, it takes some of the horsepower away from the pumps and allows it to get a better track job. Now, the poly, uh, polyacrylamide, it's actually used in a wide variety of applications. It's used in cosmetic surgery. It's used for the manufacture of contact lenses. So it's a, <coughs> it's a, it's a safe product. We, will, we have the option to use a tracer, and now the tracer is, is basically a salt-based salt compound. And that allows us, if we do two or three fracks in different locations in the well bore, by putting the tracer in, that allows us, we'll put a different one in each formation. So when it's flowing back, we know where any water is flowing back from by analysing the tracer. We have a biocide. Now, the water that we use, as I say, comes from United Utilities, so it's drinking water. We don't need to use a biocide. It's there if we were using water that maybe there was a possibility of contamination, but it isn't. We use pure, clean water all the time, so we've never had to use biocide. And the, the other product is hydrochloric acid. This, we have, again, we haven't used this, and it could be there if we ever had to start the frack off just to clean the bottom, bottom hole out. But it is such a very small amount that we would ever use, um, and it's, it's just a one shot, but we do not, and we have not used that. Now, the company that we use that supply our drilling fluids, uh, it's a company called Clear Solutions, they've recently won an award for the product that they, se that they sell and supply. And this is the same product that we use, which is Pure Ball. And they've received an award from, uh, from a very recognised body for the fact that the fluid that returns from the well could actually be redispersed re back onto farmland or agricultural land. It's that clean and that, that, that pure. We don't know that, but the, this just demonstrates that the, uh, the product that we use is a very good product. Okay, the water usage during a frack. The frack at Tracehall, we use just over 1.8 million gallons of water. Again, that was piped from a pipe from United Utilities, clean drinking water. The average use is 125 cubic metres per day over 67 days. Production wells could use, could use the frack water over and over again. These are one-off fracks that we've done. If we were into a, a production phase, we would use a lot of the water that came back to re reuse for, for the next frack. So because we've only done the hole, that's the only frack we've done today. But that's the, the amount of water that we've used. We actually, when you look at the water that's used for a frack, and I'll show you in a chart that we've got a little, uh, just coming up, is that it is very cost effective when you look at the water that's used for what we're trying to achieve here. Now, this is a comparison. This is based on per million BTUs. Now, what we've got here is the range of water used. This is in gallons, the midpoint being the average. So, typically, for a deep natural shale gas well, we'll use three gallons per million BTUs. The next one, nuclear, Ukrainian, Ukraine, 8.4, 8 to 14, 11 gallons per the 1 million BTUs. Conventional oil, 14 gallons. Go on, oil, oil, tar sands, 47, and it just goes up and up and up. So, 
you can see, even though we use a lot of water, it is very cost effective to come back per power generator. Now, there's been a number of concerns about drilling locations and how many they're going to be. Picture you've got here, very similar to the one that we've got in the back over there. This is a location in the US. This was how it well used to be drilled years ago. Many, many drilling sites. Each one of these little squares is a drilling site where there's been a rig or some production equipment, equipment at some point. A big network of roads with disruption to the local community. That is not what we do. What we've got here, this is a typical aerial view of a similar area. This is not in this area, so it's just a generic aerial view. Within that area there, we have three pads. We do what's called pad drilling nowadays. Instead of putting a single location, put a single rig on it, build another location, put another rig on it, or move the same rig around, that's a massive load of work. Big disruption to the infrastructure, expensive to do, disruptive to the local community and the countryside. We do what's called pad drilling, where we'll build a, a site which is not much bigger than the sites that we're actually using at the moment, and we'll drill a number of wells off it. We can drill 10 wells off one pad. So the rig will stay on the same location, we just skid it along, drill the next one, skid it along, drill the next one until we've drilled 10 wells. So on this picture here, there's actually 30 well sites there. And just to demonstrate where they are, that's where they are. You see that, that's a well pad, well pad, well pad. Whereas the picture you saw before, there's multiples of them. This is 30, there'll be 30 wells there, and this is typically three to five kilometers between. So, low impact, maintain a small, small footprint. Seismicity. This is an, another area that's been a, a, lot of, a lot of concern and talk about. Back on the 1st of April, we, there was a 2.3 magnitude event, which happened at our priest hall site. Initially, we got the information from deck. We were not aware of what, <coughs> what had happened and where, it, where the location was. We found out afterwards that it was very close to our location. We suspended the operations after we had a second 1.5 magnitude event, and that was on the 27th of May. We stopped operations to work with the Department of Energy and the BGS on this to try and establish, is there a connection, is there a link? At that particular point, nobody had any idea of the fact that two events had taken place close to where we were working. Sorry about that, I think it was a bit close to the projector. So, there we go, that's better. So, what we did, as soon as we'd got information that there'd been two events, we stopped the operation to, to carry out an investigation. Quadrilla commis commissioned a report. We went to a lot of eminent people that are involved in ge geophysics and geology, and gave them all the information to come up with a report that was going to be an independent report that was, was submitted to the Department of Energy once it was completed. The report has been submitted to the Department of Energy for consideration and review, along with the BGS. The BGS has said that the tremors were very small. They were very small, and that they were associated with what we, what we were doing. And the big thing here is that we can actually put an early warning system in place. Now we understand what, what is happening and what, what could happen. We, we have the ability to put an early warning system in place here, which would allow us to put surface monitoring and detect the slightest event. And one of the options we've got up to is, is to put a traffic light system up there. So we can monitor this whole situation. But anyway, the information has gone to the Department of Energy. We're just waiting for their review and their reply on this particular matter. To give you an idea of the events that actually took place uh, from Priest Hall, this is a comparison chart. It's just to give you a, an idea, because it's very difficult to imagine uh, or, or to, to quantify when you get an event like a 1.5 and a 2.3. So, what we had here, we, this was our 1.5 event, which this is based on megajoules released. Okay? So, there was, the 1.5 event released 11 megajoules. The 2.3 event was 178 megajoules. Now, a 1 and a 2 is not twice the, dip, twice the, twice the uh, magnitude. 
there's a scale and it goes it's quite a complex scale so a level three would give two thousand now there was an event happened in witness in 1976 which was a 4.5 and that was the equivalent of 355,665 megajoules now the big one on the end here to give people an idea how to quantify it is that there was an event happened in Lincolnshire back in 2008, 5.2. Now, that was obviously noticed and it was reported, and probably quite a lot of people remember it on the, on the news, but very little damage, I think there was one chimney came down. So, what you're looking at there is 3.9 million megajoules in comparison to the 11 and 178 that took place here. So that just quantifies it a little bit to get an, an idea of what what's involved. So, when we look at what the potential is in the, within the Lancashire area, <coughs> we've got a company called Regenerist to carry out an independent study. Now, we've established that there is 200 trillion cubic feet of gas in this area here. This is gas in place. Now, that is a, a fantastic amount. It's huge. Now, that is what's gas in place in the, in the licensed area that we're looking at. That doesn't mean that we can get that out. A lot of people think that, oh, that's the answer to, the, the answer to everything, but it isn't. If we can get 10 to 15 percent of that gas out, it's still a massive amount that's, that's, that's in place. So, Regenerous conducted this study to have a look at what is the commercial impact, what is the impact on the community, what jobs it can create. And from this, from this independent report, they came up with the, uh, with the numbers that in Lancashire alone, they could generate 1,700 jobs. And across the whole of the UK, 5,600 jobs. These are all jobs and businesses related to our production and development. So the drilling program runs until 2021, and the impact, which is the highest rate from where we're, we're drilling and that level of activity, would be between 2016 and 2019. Now, if we can get a large quantity of this gas out in commercial, in commercial levels, the benefit to the exchequer is six billion, is in the range of six billion pound. I mean, that's money going back into the UK coffers. I mean, that's, it's a significant amount. This is to give you an idea of why we need some additional gas. If you look at this chart here, the, the UK used to be an exporter of gas. We would drill it, I remember the gas fails. We used to export gas, we'd sell it. The decline in reserve has come across there in 1995, 1996, 1998. <coughs> hit point, point 0.0 here. Now, if you can see, we're actually an importer of it. So the UK now imports gas, we don't export it. The graph you can see at the bottom here shows electricity supplied for fuel tap in 2009 2010. It's still a major part for generating electricity as gas. So you can see that it, it is a considerable volume that's required. <coughs> We've spent a lot of time within the Quadrilla organisation trying to engage with the local communities. We welcome visitors onto our sites and uh, I hope a number of you have actually been on these visits. We welcome everybody to come and have a look. We've got very transparent view on letting people <coughs> see what we do. We want to be very open with people. So we release newsletters, we try and hold meetings like this wherever possible to try and explain to people what we do. And hopefully some of that will actually feed back into the community to take, take away some of the myths and, and, and misunderstandings of what's around in our business. We've set up with a company called PPS, and Steve's here tonight from PPS, that if anybody would like to come and see uh, our rig, we're ready to operate in again, we just contact PPS and we will welcome people on site which your visitors are around. So, we try and work with the local community, we like to engage the local, um, the local farmers and members of the public, so uh, that's a very brief version of what we do, and uh, Eric and myself would be more than happy to take questions from anybody. Thank you, I, I should have um, introduced Eric also, Eric Borg is the Chief Operating Officer for Cabrilla. Uh, is here and uh, we have Steve Molyneux and John Neville from the Environment Agency. I just wanted, before I open it to, to questions from the floor, to note that I did uh, try to um, get a speaker from HSE from the Health and Safety Executive to come tonight. 
Um, and uh, they, uh, they had to decline, uh, and uh, very politely, uh, because uh, the, the comment was, uh, we have limited resources, and our main focus is on offshore drilling. Um, so I think perhaps at some point, I would love if you could perhaps pick up on that, because you did say everything has to be monitored by HSE, and HSE are saying we do not have the capacity to monitor, and that, that was their response. I understand that before we go to general questions, someone from the Green Party would like to uh, make a, a comment. Do you want to come to the front? Yeah. And, uh, Good evening, everybody. My name is Philip Mitchell. I'm from Blackpool File Green Party. Uh, now, File is a region where uh, the first drilling took place, but the, the first uh, the building uh, was placed at uh, Priest Hall in Wheaton, and also uh, one in Singleton, both of which are just outside of Blackpool. Um, so I've been taking a, a great deal of interest in what's going on at every level of government, and uh, also what the people are observing who uh, live close to the sites. And uh, the first thing I, I, I did when I, I found out this field was going on, I did a bit of my own research and found out what's going on in America. And there was clearly a lot of problems going on there. And a lot of very intelligent people uh, were raised, raising very serious questions about this. Um, so I wrote to uh, the government, uh, the DCC, in November of uh, 2010. And I highlighted some of these uh, concerns. Uh, there were concerns about, uh, for example, spillages of, um, of, of chemicals and the spillages that come up from the ground. Um, and there were concerns about water pollution, uh, about air pollution, and about earthquakes. <coughs> and I, I told the DCC that. And um, I also wrote into a um, parliamentary inquiry which um, reported uh, last May. Um, now the conclusion of, of, of that parliamentary inquiry was that uh, don't worry everybody, it's going to be fine. And five days later there was a earthquake and uh, those two earthquakes have uh, ceased cracking a week from now for um, I think it's six months now. Uh, eight months. Yeah, eight months. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, there's the, the, what, what's striking about that is you know, how little is known about about these processes um, within government and um, within um, the UK um, amongst yourselves, that public. Um, the Speaking to the people, the other, the other thing was that um, there hadn't been a uh, consultation from anyone until the uh, planning applications had been passed, and um, there also hadn't been uh, an environmental impact assessment conducted or any kind of uh, assessment of the environmental consequences of this uh, operation. Um, so people weren't really aware of what was going on, it just really just launched them. And um, it, it, was, it had an impact on the views and everything, they were very happy about it. But obviously when the earthquake struck, uh, that made them even more angry. Um, but the, the other thing that, that, that I have noticed is that uh, you know, there have been reports of, of people are reporting more uh, problems uh, with the chest, things like asthma, and, and, and some people were suffering from uh, really severe breathlessness uh, during the period of the fracking. And, uh, and, and that, was, that, that was quite really very serious. They you know, had difficulty climbing upstairs and things like that. Um, 
So these kind of problems, which you do get in, in uh, these kind of, you do get reported uh, with these kind of operations in America. And um, if anyone's read the New Scientist uh, last week, um, they that, that, that also uh, confirmed that. Um, so, really, um, my, uh, my response to all this was to uh, appeal to the Green Party to call for more funding, and there is an emergency, sorry, an early day motion uh, going through Parliament um, with people um, can write to their MPs and ask them to sign. And that's um, an early day motion calling for a moratorium uh, to halt because um, not only in this country uh, is it apparent that we, we haven't got all the facts, but in America as well. Uh, they're doing a, a study now, uh, which is due to report in 2014. And, um, it, you know, <coughs> what, the, uh, what the risks are, and they, they actually study what the risks are, not just listen to the kind of presentation that you've been given, get given but actually look at, at, at what's happening and uh, try to come up with some improvements. Um, but my big concern is that, you know, there's, there's, there's so much of this, this, this uh, resource in the, in the country that, you know, once you start on that path, it's going to be very difficult to stop. And, you know, we're bringing up a lot of different chemicals from the shale, as well as uh, those chemicals which are put into the, the borehole. Um, so, I'm skeptical about uh, whether it, it can be made safe, but like anything else, if, if, if you are buying um, a child's toy or a car, you know, you want to know that it's safe before it's introduced. And what's quite clear to me is, you know, we're not at that point yet. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I think if we, if you want to go back again, and yeah. perhaps, because we're at the end, so you can kind of stand up, is that all right? Yeah. But I think that was great that you opened up issues of what people can do already. Okay. Um, so, now genuinely over any questions, start the floor. Yes? I could ask Paul, what damage was done when the earthquakes occurred? Was there any reported damage to property? There was no reported damage to any property. There was one or two people thought they may have felt something, but there was no report of any damage. It would be helpful, I think, and I know you don't want to necessarily say who you are, but you might say where you're from, or just so that we have an idea of whether you're a professor of Hebrew or whatever. Professor Hebrew. Thank you very much. I saw a couple of hands over there and one there. Yes? yes. I uh, <coughs> live in Orson, uh, South Wales. Uh, Paul, has he seen gas lines? I have seen gas lines. And secondly, can you account for the discrepancies between <laughs> gas lines and your presentation? I certainly can. The, the ridging, you know, I explained to you how we have quite a rigid program of steel casing and cementing, steel, steel casing, cementing, <coughs> steel casing and cementing. A lot of the wells that were drilled in the States years ago had a different casing regime. The, they were drilling into the initial formation, and do you remember, going back to what I was saying earlier, that when we identify that there's a water course, we go 500 feet past that. That was not a requirement years ago, and practices, so we could, for economic reasons, were that they would drill 50 feet past any water course. They would put the steel casing in, they would cement it. They would then do the same, they would drill into the next section, and they would drill down, but they would not put a secondary barrier within that system until they got to the very bottom of the well, which was the area that they were interested in, where they would, they would drill and they would get the gas coming back into the well. Now, there was always the possibility, without the full containment of the, the way that we built it with steel casing and cement, that you would have a cavity in there that the gas could potentially build up, and because you've got such a small barrier between the bottom of the well, which is typically 50 foot in any water course, as that, water would, as that gas would accumulate in there, there was always the possibility that you could get some leakage or migration across such a small barrier. And that is why we have such a major barrier and we have a different kissing regime altogether. So full containment within that. And it's, what is quite interesting is that, as, as Mr. Mitchell mentioned, that, uh, about moratoriums, well, there was one in, for drilling and fracking in New York, which has recently been 
uh, released and a lot of the re recommendations in there were based on drilling 500 feet past the water course, having intermediate casing, so we're al already doing a lot of the things that were actually I identified in that report. Right, uh, Park mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm Paul. sorry, it's very difficult to see <coughs> Paul Blaine Banks. Um, it was a question, it was a point of clarification really to Mr Mitchell, if you don't mind. Uh, you, you talked about asthma and people struggling, um, health reasons. Yeah, health reasons. It was just, I don't want to make you walk all the way down there for what I'm about to It was just a point of clarification. Is that from America or is that from where the drillings occurred on the files? Where, where were you gathering your evidence from? Uh, when I asked people, they say that they've had any. Well, you know whether they've had noticed any increase. Uh, there have been increases in use of um, uh, asthma uh, inhalers. Thank you, and um, and they, you know, they were suffering from breathlessness during the course of the fracking, and they've never had any problems like that before in their lives. Can I? I mean, that's it's it's a small number. Yeah. Uh, but obviously I can't ask anybody. It was a point of clarification, but can I just redirect that question over to this side now and say, has there been any research done or any analysis or data looked at specifically to what's been said uh, in, in that area while drilling has been taking well, place? One, one of the things is nobody's actually reported any problems. And I guess one of the questions, I know that the local councillor from that area basically you're the one that's instigating people having problems. There hasn't, there hasn't been an issue with anybody well. actually having problems. I, I'm only repeating what the local council said to you. Okay. And, <laughs> you know, one of the questions I would have is what would possibly cause that? You know, what, what, what would cause someone to have breathing problems when, when the fracture <coughs> operation is going on that lives miles from where the site is? come from these naturally occurring fissures in the rock. I mean, do you actually know how far your water spreads out and how many fissures there are in the rock? Can you, can you be as accurate as that? You've got some, you have some information from where seismic's been done in the area, so you can see the different layers, and you know where the different layers of rock are. Okay, and then you can see from basically, you can do computer simulations to tell you how, how high your frack grows and how long it grows. So you can see two miles down, can you? Yes. And say exactly what there is, what fishes there are down there. You can see more than two miles. That's what, that's what you? seismic you, you can probably... So when you frack, right, you don't cause any more, do you? I mean, how do you get the gas out? The gas comes back up the well. What do you do the to the shale to make the gas come out? Crack it open. You crack it open. So if you're cracking that open, yes, you're telling me that you're you can guarantee that that gas will not come out. I can guarantee that it won't come out from the surface. There is no physical way possible to, to do a hydraulic crack at seven or eight thousand feet deep and create a crack that comes back to the surface. And and I mean that's not you, that that is 
Gas will find a way. Water will find a way. Gas will find a way. Can we just let Bears from the environment agency coming up as well. Uh, well, I'll just, um, just probably just give you some information about that. Yeah, um, I think everybody can agree that when people talk about people's health, that's quite a noted issue. And I think it's very important to have the facts around that. Um, if people are believe they're suffering from health effects associated with anything, it's very important that they go to the GP and talk about that and to the GP and health effects are reported to the uh, Health Protection Agency through the Primary Care Trust, and they will look at potential health effects of any, of any means. And that is the route to go through the proper competent health authorities. Uh, and if you're worried about health effects around anything, it's important you speak to the proper competent health authorities with respect to the Green Party, and I'm probably respect to the Driller as well, but not the competent health authorities. So you need to get proper story from the proper people. The HPA and Health Protection Agency nationally are looking into potential health impacts from the fracking as an industry and we'll probably report back in due course um, I don't know if that was months, two months or six months. Um, but what I, I would say is that uh, anything that's to do with local air pollution that could impact on asthma, things like that, very important that you inform your local authority um, uh, uh, environmental health uh, protection department, they will look into it. Um, on our assessment, we would not see that any the chemicals that we use in the fracking process would decrease or would potentially have an impact on, on air quality or on health of the factory there. 98.5% of the frack food that uses water, water and sand and the, the chemicals that have been used up at Prusor don't present an immediate risk to, to air pollution. We're we monitoring the air quality. Yeah, uh, responsibility for monitoring local air quality is the local authority direct um, uh, protection department. Thank you for that. I've got great confidence in that. Right. Now, are, are we still on the same subject? Or Okay, so uh, you said you were. John and the person behind you, first of all. Yeah, I'm Tom Blaine from the Bank's Parish Council. I'm the chairman of the Bank's Parish Council, where the oil wells can drill. Uh, and what I would like to say as an ex-miner, I was a miner, and down the beach, you down a shaft, down a pit, down a haulage, down another haulage, sometimes it would take us an hour to get to that shale gas. And I've seen a lot of my mates lose their life. I've seen a lot of my mates with silicosis and different things still dying. Mm. This is a borehole that's going down into the ground to get that gas. Mm. And it's not taking the bowel to the earth where it can collapse back in. And this is what happens, he starts with a sigmatic thing. This all happened when we were young. As a miner, I think you start to realise a lot of us gave our life to bring this stuff up. If they can bring it up a lot easier and a lot better, I think it's a lot safer for everyone. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John Hudson from Charlton. Uh, just going on the health issue, at one of the previous meetings, a very important uh, point was raised, and that is the psychological effect. Now, the, the Japanese government are finding this with the aftermath of the nuclear um, reactors there, that the major legacy, that there's a whole issue about the more the scientific community, um, you know, give lashings and lashings of, of reassurance about how levels are not going to affect people's health. You've got this converse effect where the more that an official body does that, the less people believe them. But the major impact that they're saying, and you're not talking about just a few people who are hypochondriacs, there is a mass effect on the population psychologically because they can't hear anything, they can't see anything, they just don't know what's going to happen. And I don't think that issue has been taken seriously enough uh, uh, by this particular section of industry. Right, I'm sorry, in the middle, yeah. and then I'll in the front, yes, Me? yes, please. I'm sorry, you've been waiting. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Ken Jones, I live up the road in Leyland, and I'd like to change the emphasis slightly. I don't believe you're going to kill anybody, or poison us, or do anything like that, <coughs> but you are going to have an impact in ways you don't know, and we don't know, and no one else knows. You are going to have an impact on this community. There might even be a disastrous impact. We don't think so, but there might be. So there will be a price for this community generally in Lancashire to pay to have you 
pumping this stuff out. Mm. Now, I would like to know, what do we get? What's the payback for this community? Now, it's all very well talking about six billion quid for them to spend in Westminster on building another bloody royal yacht or something. <laughs> <laughs> we won't see that six <laughs> billion Yeah. We won't see that. So what do we as a community benefit from all this buggeration that we're going to get from you, which you don't know and we don't know either? Okay. Good question. First of all, we, t we want to create as many jobs, bring employment back to the area. We know that it's been devastated recently and we know that it's, it's in a poor way. But we want to try and create some extra work to benefit the community as a whole. We know that there will be a lot of businesses that can develop from this, associated businesses that will be able to, to be set up engineering shops and um, manufacturing facilities, transport. You tend to find that people use the, the word the Aberdeen effect. I'm not using it to that extent. But what happened in Aberdeen, which was a very small fishing town <coughs> community, grew as the oil industry grew at that particular point, and to a point now where it is a flourishing, flourishing town with you know very good employment rates. So that is an added benefit to the community. Now the infrastructure around the area. I mean, obviously we have no control over what happens from Westminster with regard to funds and benefits coming back to the local community. But you know, all we can say is that you know we will try and put, put the best infrastructure in place related to our activities, minimum impact on the local communities. This is why the, the pad drilling would have such a lower impact on, on transportation, haulage, noise, nuisance effect, to try and minimise that. So we're trying to do our bit, but obviously we, we can't force Westminster, in, Westminster into putting taxation and benefits for the local community. So uh, do we, excuse me Chair, do we get planning game? Will you put money into local swimming baths, health centres, that kind of thing? Well, we, we look very closely at local communities and uh, you know, where possible we will try and help them and support them. It's this growing and trying to develop a relationship with people that, you know, we want to share some of that benefit but there's limits to how far we can go with it. But, you know, for sure, we, we want to try and do the best we can for any local community where we are. Now. And there, there's some stuff going on where they're trying to, in, in, in London, they're trying to push some of the tax money back to locally. It actually started with the wind farms, where the people were being impacted by, by wind farms. And so now they're trying to push some of the, the, the tax money that comes from that back to local. But that's up to the politicians down there right now. I mean, we, we obviously don't have any control over that. I don't think you have any control here. But, but that's, I'm sure it's something that you can work on from that side. Okay, so I've got Alan in the middle, Jennifer in the corner, and then there are three more people. You've been very convincing on the, the actual drilling of the hole and the protection that that's going to get. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very exciting prospect to have all this money coming into the region. Um, you said at one stage that you are confident you can capture 20% of the gas that lies there. Now, does the other 80% wait for better technology, or does it seep its way out? It sounds great that we're, for once, for once, we're leaving something to our children's children's children. <laughs> That's a nice thought. <laughs> if, it's safely, if it's safely locked with a big hole underground, I like that idea. If, as the lady said back there, it's seeping out, and no, dare I say, into my bathtubs, then... <laughs> No, no, not it, so good. it doesn't. Really sure. the, I mean, <laughs> this is true with all oil and gas, not just not just shale gas in particular. But you don't recover all the oil or gas from the rock. I mean, I've actually got a piece of shale here. But you loosen it. Well, but I mean, I can pass this around, or you can come come up after. You can see a piece of shale, and you can see if you come up close, and you can see even back there. There's little white lines and stuff. These are the natural fractures that are in the shale. And I'm not a geologist, but you can, you can get lots of good geology, and I'll show you as the rocks were laid down. They were naturally fractures. Fluids came through as that came down. The earth moved. I mean, this stuff was buried. Right, right now we're at 10,000 feet. It's been down 20, 30,000 feet underground, come back up, and, that, and, it, and it naturally cracks the rock, but it's under pressure where it's at down there now, so those cracks are closed. So the gas that we produce from shale is actually trapped in all the, all the little cracks, mostly. There's, there's some gas in the rock matrix itself, 
but shale is so impermeable that it takes, for a molecule of gas to go from there to there would take years, years, like tens of years. The only way it can move is through all the tiny, the tiny cracks that are in, in that shale rock. And when we do a hydraulic fracture, all we're doing is pumping water, mostly through the, the, the weak parts where the cracks are already there, to open them up enough that we can get some grains of sand in so that the gas can flow back. If, if you're not in a place where we put that sand, right, that's why we have to put the sand in there. That's the whole purpose of the hydraulic fracture is to get those sand grains in there. If you're not in a place where that sand is, the gas can't flow through it. That's why we have to do the hydraulic fractures to start with, why you, you can't just drill a well in and all the gas just flows into it because there's not enough ability in this rock to actually allow gas to flow through it. That's why the gas has been there for 100 million years. Just quick supplementary, who's going to get the other 80% out? Probably, no, pro probably nobody. I mean, there, in 100 years from now, there may be technology to do that, but normally you wouldn't, that, that gas just doesn't come out. You can't, because it, it's still trapped in the rock. And it, it can't get to those little those little fractures to actually have a path to come out. Thank you. Um, coming back to the gas question, I've read recently that Cordrill have uh, invested a lot of money in gas monitoring technology for the sites. And I wondered if, what the motivation and the reason behind that investment is if there's no problem with air pollution or gas getting into the air locally. Well, one of the, one of the main reasons is to give a comfort level people around the site so that we can, if somebody says you're leaking gas or there's gas coming in the ground, we want to be able to prove that it's not. And the only way you can do that is to monitor it. Isn't that the job of the, um, the environment agency to monitor what you do? Uh, Why should we believe you that your readings are right and your equipment? Isn't it an independent thing for the environment agency to be doing that? Well, this is <laughs> Generally, where there's any, this type of operation, where there's this borehole being put into ground and trying to detect methane, whether it's through this type of operation or landfills, then the onus is on the operator to put to pay for that technology to put in and to pay for the monitoring, rather than that uh, bill to come on the, the taxpayer. Now, it's only appropriate <coughs> that the industry that's given the benefit out of that activity uh, puts the cost into monitoring its own activities. What we would do as a regulator is ensure that um, that engineering is conducted, is put in place correctly, and that monitoring is done to the highest standards in the country. Isn't that putting rather a lot of faith in the companies, though, by the environment agency? I mean, how often do you go out on site, for example? There seems to be a bit of confusion over that Probably in the environment agency. Uh, different people say, you know, we go so many times a month and this, that, and the other. There seems to be controversy over that. I mean, how can we trust you guys? Some people like to ask the question at different times, and then they say that, um, use that to kind of discredit um, the, the information that we get out. We've probably been, well, we've been to Beckers all five times, we've um, inspected all the three sites that have been drilled in more than <coughs> 20 times, I think, since this May. That's quite Thank a big answer, though, isn't it? It's that we work with these people. You know, it's, it's an alliance, it's a relationship that we've got to develop, and, uh, you know, we, we have to work in an alliance. There's our responsibility to make sure that the, the company well, ourselves, DAC and the HSE, it's responsible to make a company, make sure the company are working to the best standards out there. But that's our role. Right, now I had, well, <laughs> <laughs> I had three people here, yes, the gentleman here, and the spot of you, and the uh, gentleman in front, and then I'll start to go back again. Uh, Michael Robinson, I'll, oh, sorry, that one. Okay. No, you All right. Sorry. Nigel Robinson, I live near Wigan. I am a geologist, professional geologist. Uh, I don't work in this industry, I work in the waste industry actually, so I work very daily with the environment agency. <coughs> the question about fractured rocks, um, I've worked with, with drilling, the drilling industry for many years, and yes, it is perfectly capable, perfectly capable of fracturing rocks at a particular horizon uh, with, with no uh, uh, fracturing coming up through the surface. So I'm quite comfortable with that. And as far as measuring it is concerned, it's quite feasible because the seismic velocity changes with more fraction. Thanks, Henry. That's helpful. Yeah. Hi, I'm George from Westwood Bank. Uh, I've got some of the environment's agents, please. Right? Okay. 
Um, I've read the uh, blowback report. Um, obviously, I think you've put on the internet, but obviously, which shows the minerals, the radioactive material that blowback uh, brings up. Does that blowback report also show the consistencies of the fracking chemicals that go into it? Uh, well, it shows the, the flowbacks we see back up. It's probably about 80% of the, the water that's put into the ground. Uh, it doesn't return to probably 20 to 40% return. Yeah. Um, and then 40 on that. About 40 on that, okay. Um, so we, we're, not, we're not measuring like for like in terms of what's going on and what's coming out. Um, so we, how we've monitored for it so far is on the basis of the, the materials that we have that have been using and looking for evidence of that coming out. And that's for us to have some confidence because this is a new industry in terms of us understanding what the, the makeup of the flowback water is in its entirety and also to help us understand that the, the disposal of that flowback water is going to the correct places and properly regulated. So uh, I don't find that. So does, does that flowback report have any the consistency, like you've made with all the other material, minerals, radioactive, does it also, if I look at that report, can I see what chemicals are in fracking? fracking well, you'll see um, acrylamide, which is on the basis of polychromide, that it's not it. There's no other bespoke chemicals that have gone into the initial frack and pre salt Hydrochloric acid will break down to uh, to salts, which would be masked by it. Uh, by masked by so the there's nothing problem. missing off that report? There's not no chemical. We can see, no. 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 There's nothing that, that, that what the flow back waters that we've got back are uh, high in salts, <coughs> high in metals, we've got the, the norm, natural decay radioactive material that's associated with the deep the, the shell deposits that we were expected to see. Um, and nothing, and we've got a uh, chromine associated with some of the polychromine that's gone into them. Nothing that's very much that we weren't, our joy just weren't expecting. No, it's not our joy, it's to know that when I read that report, everything that what we're put in that hole. The percentage of it, I will be able to read and say that is what is in that. Well, what you won't get is what, what's gone in will come out. What's gone in will come out, and you've reported on that. That report includes all that chemical. Well, no, because you get 80% of the percentage, I'm talking about parts per million of the chemical that's injected into it. Yeah, I think what. The difference is, is you're trying to find out what we put in, I don't know what you put and in. all they can say is what came out. Why are you only interested in what came out? Because what came out has to be what went in because you're going to dispose of it. So what they put in that you take out, you're then going to dispose of safely. So you must know exactly what's come out. We won't dispose of it. Cool. No, but you have to you have to be aware of that material. No. So at the moment then are you aware of the material that went in? When it came back out, are you aware of the material that went in? It's like you lost me. The chemicals that we use, we would use the then they got to look at and check this before, before we ever did it. Right. We can't pump anything into the well without. So, that, so you know, yeah, that's why right. they discuss with you what you're pumping in, but then on the report for the public to see, we can't see what you pumped in. It's available on our website. Well, everything you pump in, all yeah. the time, yeah. all the time. Every single thing. The process for. The process for Basically, if anybody wants to inject chemicals into into, into the ground, then they uh, for a process, they have to be declared to to the environment agency on public register. Um, we our chemicals assessment unit then determines whether they're at risk to um, risk to groundwater. That's verified by uh, <coughs> a body called JAG, um, DAG, which is the Joint Groundwater Directive Agency, which is also in Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, once our, 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 our chemists and our judges have confirmed that there are no risks, then we would say to to uh, the that they're okay to use. Um, we expect the judges to make that publicly available, and then we would monitor flow of that water to see. Uh, but at this, at this stage, uh, we're monitoring flow of that water to see what's coming out. Thank you. And that's the moment Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question and the answers as well, because I think that had been historically in terms of this kind of journey, that was an issue that if things were commercially sensitive, companies did not want to reveal it. <coughs> and I think it's reassuring I think it's to know that you now have to do that. I mean, we're clear about that, yeah? yeah. And then that was always the case in, in this country. Right. There were some places in the US that they they would say, you know, we don't want to say what it is, but most places in the U.S. don't do that. All, all the major 
oil and gas companies in the US, all the school of oil and gas companies. I hope it's probably just useful to say that one of the differences between the US and the UK is in the US, processes like fracking have been regulated state to state. So what companies do, or what they're required to do, or what they're required to report, uh, can be different. Whereas in the UK, there is between DEC, ourselves, and HSC, there's one regulatory regime, or a series of regulatory regimes, where that's consistent with the country. Yeah. Thank you. Right, I've got the speaker here, and another three lined up, and then I'll ask for more time. Okay. I'm uh, Dr. Brennan, a certain CPRE. I'd just like to um, ask a few questions that I can possibly make a comment to. Now, you described the, uh, an excellent engineering design for your budget and wells. Now, I assume uh, that that is your own in-house uh, design. It's a voluntary, but not conforming to some uh, engineering specification. Well, the, the, the HSE regulates the well design. So one of the things that we have to do in, in, in the UK, which is a lot different than say in the United States. In the United States, the company would say, this is the way we're gonna drill our well. There's a couple of very basic guidelines they have to follow and then they would have the design. Here, we have to have our design approved by a third party. So there, there are well examiners in the UK that, that do, I mean, some are offshore, some are onshore. There's, I think on average, there's 30 or 40 wells drilled onshore in UK every year. So there's a industry that does that. So there's a well examiner that we would take our, our well design and say, this is what we have to do. We have certain re re requirements from the HSE or from the Lancashire County Council you know, on protecting aquifers and, and, and covering certain formations and that. So we would take that, it has to go to, to the well examiner and then the well examiner goes through it, highlights anything that he would see as a discrepancy or a problem, and sends that to the HSC. So we send our design to the HSC, and then he sends uh, basically a report on whether that design is adequate or not. Now the key element of that answer is that this is being controlled by the HSC, mm -hmm. Health and Safety Executive. Uh, the engineering that, we're, uh, that they're concerned with is that it will be safe for those that operate the well. It's not concerned with these wider issues of environmental impact. Exactly. And that is a very important consideration. Exactly. And the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, Institution of Gas Engineers and Managers um, uh, it says, I'm reading this from the uh, Tyndall Climatic uh, Research uh, Centre, it says, uh, recommend that standards are needed within the UK and internationally <coughs> to ensure the consistency of safety measures and to guarantee that environmentally damaging or dangerous practices, such as have been recorded in the US, do not occur within the UK. Now, would you, <coughs> your company, I, I take it, would be happy uh, to see such regulation in place. But you would agree that it's not in place at the moment? No, I would disagree that it's not in place. I think and the HSE gets a lot of flack because they won't do <coughs> things like this. And, and that's a... Uh, well, if I may say so, there's no point in us arguing about that. I just want to say that I uh, differ strongly with that. Uh, the HSE, I, I can go on and... Uh, uh, this report uh, uh, refers back again to this element uh, that uh, is so unsatisfactory in the UK regulation uh, that, that we don't have in place um, uh, a proper environmental impact assessment. For example, now, can I ask you, uh, are your uh, pads uh, um, uh, uh, below the one hectare uh, area? Yes. So that you escape the need yeah. for an environmental impact. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, where that would normally be done is when you go to the development stage. Okay, and, and that's you know, not some special regulation for us or anything like that. That's, like I said, there's 30 to 40 wells drilled onshore in the UK every year for I don't know how many years going back. And, and pull the records off the deck that's on there for at least the last 10 years. So, yeah, so that's, 
the normal drilling cycle for the UK, we have an exploration model, which is what we're doing, it's temporary. In order to go to the production <coughs> side, we want to say, we want to produce gas from that. That's when all the other environmental statements, I mean, we already have to do like traffic and stuff like that. We do some of the archeological, we have birds and newts and bats and, and various you know, things like that, same as a, basically any other construction site. But to go to development, then you go through a whole bigger regime of impact statements. Can I just say, if I was asking, yeah, it was probably going to be about a assessment, because this is a local authority thing to plan and scale. It's to do with the Global Design Development Protection Board, and that's the Global Design Protection Board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, um, the environment agency who relates with HSC and our geologists make an assessment of whether that design is good enough to protect the environment. So that assessment is made, is made uh, in the liaison between ourselves and HSC. Well, that is, um, if I may say so, a, a, a rather second rate way of doing this. In, in the normal uh, course of events, I think the general public would be much more assured to see. Uh, the environmental impact assessments were carried out in the normal the, way. The environmental impact assessment, that isn't basically each borehole is assessed by the HSC environment agency specifically. So at the moment, there's, there's, through the planning commission, there's five boreholes that are planning commission. Three have been drilled. Each of those boreholes in the well designs have a separate assessment by the HSC environment agency. The overall environmental impact assessment of the operation which the housing one should be done at a planning stage is a wider issue. The, the two separate, there are two separate things there. Be just because there isn't an environmental impact assessment, because the company aren't at a development stage, which is required for the planning, doesn't mean that no assessment in terms of the integrity of the boreholes, the protection of the environment, hasn't been done. For the, for the three sites that have been drilled, the complete assessment has been done by the HSC and the environment agency. Are these available in the public domain? Isn't that in, in fact an assessment of the well design? Who actually assesses the construction of the well? The HSC. Right. They actually inspect the site construction. The HSC's responsibility to ensure that uh, well design and its construction. Can, can, I, can I interject? Because um, I, I did pose a question earlier. Is um, there any the comments of HSC when they said they couldn't come, that they don't have the resources to deal with this. Are we actually saying there's a, a mechanism, but there are the resources to be with money? I, I, don't, want I, put, I, I, don't, I don't want to put words in health in HSC's mouth because the HSC aren't here to say that. But I would imagine the HSC said so they haven't got the resources to be able to finish public meetings. No, no. actually, no. If they, they said, if they said to you in official capacity that they don't feel they've got the resources to monitor this activity, then that's what you need to take up with the agency. It's hardly reassuring to the public that the HSC uh, is playing such a huge role in the regulation of this industry at the moment. Uh, can't come to a meeting like this because it hasn't got the resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. If I can move on. There are other people waiting. So uh, yeah. Now, the, yeah. when you withdraw the fluid, uh, the traffic fluid from mm -hmm. the, uh, the bore, do you capture the uh, gases that escape with the withdrawal fluid? Yes, we flare off the, during the test period. Where we're testing right now because we don't have generators or pipelines or anything like that. So right now the only thing we can do with the gas is we flare it off. So we've actually got a high volume separator on the site so we can take, it's basically designed to take frac fluid, lots of volume of frac fluid coming back, separate the gas off, the gas goes one way to a flare, the water goes another way to a tank. Is it true to say that at the moment uh, you're not under compulsion to do that? So mm. you know, so we, we, are you asking, could we, could we just vent the methane? No, we can't, we can't vent the methane. What we're supposed to, we have to flare. Right. We can't just release it down. This is an environmental... Uh, uh, well, it, it would be a safety issue. Well, even even issue. without the environmental side of it, which obviously you don't want to vent much methane anyway, but even <coughs> if you discount the environmental side, from a safety standpoint, you wouldn't want to 
the methane venting off. Well, in this site, uh, there's, there's a report by House and Company, yeah. um, at Hal, I should say, um, um, uh, uh, assessing the uh, uh, methane venting off the greenhouse gas footprint of the methane that escapes with the fluid as it's withdrawn. And it's very, very substantial. This is based on uh, American practice. Well, uh, actually, um, and so that, that report is <coughs> pretty well discounted by all the other, even the, some of the big green groups don't go in there. Even the other people at Cornell, there's a big fight at Cornell. Cornell's the, the university that, that uh, Professor uh, Howard works at, and even the Cornell people, even the guys at the Tyndall Center, don't use that report too much anymore. But, I mean, it, that report is out there, but it's been pretty well done. I mean, one of the things they used in that report was methane loss from Russian pipelines. And if anybody's ever worked in the oil and gas business in Russia, Oh, that Russia's got oil but, running but, across the ground. Hang on, that's, that, that's still what we said. She starts from one point and uh, uh, gives an indication of where you carried out the search. Uh, to ne the next point, what it's done is it's highlighted the potential problem. Yeah. So, uh, well, one of, you know, one of the ways that you do that is by having the high volume separators. So you can separate the gas. And, and trying to look at some of the <coughs> Russian operations and converting them to here, you it you must work. If I may stop you there, Robert, you mustn't rubbish a report. Because I don't have to. I, I, don't, I'm, I can't say okay, it. I, but, I, but I can, you can, it's yeah, easy to look and see the other academics that rubbish that report. Of course. In, in, in fact, the authors of this report, one of their um, points they make repeatedly is for the need for more information, mm -hmm. which at the moment, uh, only there, there, was another, there was another report by, I think it, I don't remember who it was. There are, there are, there are, there are, there are, and this is one of the most recent ones. Mm -hmm. But, but, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there is no doubt that there is an issue over that aspect of it. And, uh, so, uh, if I can move on, because can, of time. Can we, can we move on? Uh, can we one more point? Well, you, 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 I wait very patiently while I'm yeah. uh, the, um, the, 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 the Environment Agency and Health and Safety um, take the, their stand from the point of view that the, the, the site is well designed and work as designed. And in other words, it would be properly executed and always operated correctly. Now, we know from state uh, experience in the states particularly, and in, in, in the industry more widely, including the production of oil as opposed to gas, that, um, that for example, we can, that there are problems of the actual execution of what are good designs. Uh, for example, the quality of the cement that's used and whether it's got the, the right physical property to do its job. And we've seen the, the, the uh, calamity in the uh, as a result of the cement not being of the right grade. And the, the health and safety and the environment agency uh, assess the well on the basis that it will be well designed, well constructed, and properly managed. And it doesn't take into account the possibility uh, that these processes will be flawed and what the consequences mm. of lapses in you know, human I can't say that like the HSE issue is for, for actually reviews all the stuff that we use. We have to send reports and logs and job reports and uh, the graphs from the cement jobs and bond logs and all that. The HSE sees all that. Plus our independent well examiner also sees that. And, and plus he comes to the site and inspects things every once in a while too. So one of the things that as a company that we would like to see is more independent inspections, either you know, from environmental agency, the HSE, or, or whether you know, in the future if, if, if this actually works and, and there are more wells drilled. So there are inspectors that come out and we're, we're more than happy to have people come out and inspect our wells. 
And the main reason for us to say that is because we're confident in what we're doing, but we want people that are around us to have some confidence too. It's not good enough for me just to come up here and say, oh, we're doing everything right. There should be an independent look from these guys when they come out and look at our stuff. And when HSE comes down, they've been down when we were fracking, they were on site when we were fracking. So <clears throat> independent well examiner comes out and looks at stuff. So we're all for having more examinations on site. I mean, I think what we've been throwing around for a little bit now is the issue about monitoring and inspections. And um, we can't obviously watch that tonight. So perhaps we need to help you hold that as something that you want to do more investigation. I've got Sean and Ken here and then Gail. And then I'll start to look at some more speakers if we still time. Yes, just on the, the question of monitoring, uh, you've got the, the temporary licence to do exploratory drilling over 420 square kilometres, <coughs> is it? 500. Uh, temporary licence, 1,200 kilometres. 1,200 square kilometres. 1,200 square kilometres. Um, what if we do get the new Aberdeen? Have, have you as a company got the capacity to develop the whole of that, that site, or will it go out to other companies? What would probably happen at that point is we'd have to take investment from other companies. What normally happens in oil and gas is you end up in partner to partner up. So we want to maintain control. So that's our thing for having the original part. <coughs> we would maintain the controlling interest, but then other companies would, would have to invest money. It would take billions of dollars to do that. So that the health and safety executive that apparently don't have enough resources spare to send somebody to this meeting will be expected to scale up <coughs> virtually overnight <coughs> to cover 1,200 square kilometres. Yeah, it wouldn't, be over, it wouldn't be overnight because just the, just the <coughs> uh, to go to the development phase to, to convert the license over to that would we estimate would be at least two years. To, to just kind of while we've got shrinking budgets, that's the environment. Yeah. Uh, do you want a quick comment on that? Yes, uh, the, I suppose the comment uh, is um, speaking uh, on, on behalf of the Parliamentary Select Committee that reported back in May. Uh, whilst the industry is going to be to the UK, and this is an exploratory phase, the Parliamentary um, uh, Scrutiny Panel asked for the UK regulators to consider uh, what a continuing <coughs> regulation of an industry that if it went on to development phase because it would obviously scale up would mean for UK regulators and whether UK regulators had the capacity to be able to deal with a new industry that was, mm -hmm. was developing that mm -hmm. developing and what measures would have to be put in place to be able to ensure that it was, was adequately regulated. So that's a question that's been put by Parliament uh, to, uh, to the regulatory bodies and that's interesting. So he's um, I think you want to come in, did you? Yeah, question? Yeah, question kind of First of all, quite know that. Um, you put on the screen there the uh, sodium traces. Uh, that's not on your website, right? Um, so I know what trace is, because my background is chemistry. <coughs> It's hard to see from back there. The bit on the bottom, I just copied from our website and pasted uh -huh. it in. So there's the tracer at the bottom. We put 4,000 grams of the tracer. So that's 4,000 grams of sodium salt. Yeah. Um, tracer is something you can detect. Yeah. So what, what is it? What is it you detect? The radioactivity? No, it's not, it's, it's not a radioactive tracer. And that does cause some confusion because, and even that, the company that actually does that, which we put on there too, they do have a tracer that's a radioactive tracer. That's not what we're using. So basically what they're doing is looking at the salts and they can identify the salts in parts per billion. So each different one has a, they've got 20 something different kinds and put a different salt in each, each frack. So that when the water comes back, we can say this much came from the first frack, this much came from the second frack. <coughs> they're not. They're not radioactive. <coughs> I understand. It doesn't necessarily have to be radioactive. Yeah. But the question is, how do you actually trace it? How how do you actually measure or detect 
uh, that particular data, what's, what's the method? Please. I couldn't actually tell you that. They're doing their lab. We actually have to send the samples back to Canada. Right. That's a lot. Okay. Well, they're so pulling the, 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 the second point I was talking about was fairly. At, at preschool, um, nobody seems to have seen any flare. It's something we can see for miles. As, Apparently as, not, because we did flare. What they flared. I have to go back and look. And, and I, I think that's May. for information. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, can you pick up the question about the thing? One of the things that we do have is an enclosed flare. We were trying, I was trying to move this on. Are they, so if they're things that you could talk to them about afterwards, because we'll have a few minutes as we have to be real. And Gail and then I'm going to try to speak this year. Hi, yeah. Um, there was a three-year study done in the States. The EPA did a study on Wyoming, and it was conclusively found that the chemicals that were polluting and that the, the extracted from the polluted areas, could the, some of the chemicals in there could only have been got from the fracking process. Now, that's a report, that's, that's a study that's available on the Internet, and it's conclusive. Would you, would you agree with that? No, because it's not a conclusive study yet. Why does it say it is? Well, I mean, it's not a conclusive study. They're still looking at that. And part of the problem is, is they're not sure what they found. No, no, no. They mention the, chem the chemicals are listed in the report. Yeah. The, read, of what read, they found. And yeah, it's, uh, read, read, read the whole report. I have right? done. Now, that report is from the EPA. It's from the, the federal body in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what, what they found is not in drinking water wells. They didn't find anything in drinking water wells, right? They, they did drill another monitor well, I think two monitor wells, that they drilled into another oil and gas zone below all the drinking water, and they found chemicals in that, but they're not sure whether it's from their own drilling, whether it's from the construction of the well, or whether it came from fracking. One of the other things that you really have to pay attention to in that report is what is that whole area? Like what's the, one is not a shale, those aren't shale wells for one thing. It's in an oil field, an old oil field. And what they used to do in that oil field, is legacy stuff from a long time ago, is when they flowed back wells, and when they produced wells, they just dug a hole in the ground. They didn't line it, they didn't put stuff in tanks, they just dug a hole. And they would flow the wells back, which brought back crack fluid, it brought back oil, whatever came out, it just went into the ground. The other thing, what they have found, and you might what you might be interpreting in that study, is they have found all kinds of stuff that leaked out of those pits. Because there was I mean, I don't know, hundreds, at least hundreds, I don't know if, 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 if maybe if not more. But that is one of the areas where they used to just pour stuff on the ground. So what you, are you, leaks into the ground. you, are you saying that there's no contamination in the States whatsoever from just the process of fracking? <laughs> so far. So there's no, none anywhere at so, all? So far there's never been, and the, the EPA just tell us. still yeah. so far there's never been right. fresh water back. Can, can I just say, up ground. until Christmas you were saying that exact same thing about mm -hmm. methane gas pollution. And now it's been proved that it actually has been no, methane gas pollution. No, we've never said that on methane no, gas pollution. You've said it, and so have a lot of the U.S. shale companies said they're and absolutely Anybody that's come on, on one of the tours or anybody that's come to the sites, we actually have a board, and I almost always put a drawing up. And actually, in the full, this, this is like the 10-minute version or 15-minute version of this, but I'll show you exactly how you get methane to groundwater. It's easy to do. It's been done in the States. It's easy to put methane yeah, in now I'm not saying you and that's what he that's what he was talking about earlier. If you drill the well, one, one of the big things in the states they didn't do, and, and this is just the way they've done it for the last hundred years, especially in Pennsylvania, is they don't run all the same numbers of pipe in the ground. So they will put what they it's called the the surface casing. It's what's supposed to protect the aquifers. And they'll run that through the aquifer in Pennsylvania and New York. They're only required to go at 50, 75 feet yeah. below that. I understand that. Okay. And if they either miss because they thought the aquifer was here and it was really 50 feet lower, they just never set any pipe across it. Then the next piece of pipe that they put in the ground went all the way to where the oil and gas was. Mm -hmm. That's what they were. Mm -hmm. And they would only cover the cement across the bottom part, so the whole top part would be open. Well, the other thing you have to look at is the area, what, what's the geology of the area? 
for the last, since the, last, since the mid 1800s, they've been producing oil and gas from all that shallow stuff in Pennsylvania. So they're going right through producing oil and gas areas and leaving it exposed. So if they didn't hit it right, when they put that first piece of pipe across there, they're taking gas right from below, goes right up, where they drill the hole, right back out in an aquifer. To so what extent, I that's been I done all like, over in Pennsylvania. I understand that's what you're saying now, but what I'm saying is, the way you're saying, well, there's been no proven case of chemical pollution. Right. You were saying before Christmas, no, well, there's actually been no... No, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's not been frac fluid. It never that's got frac fluid that's what I mean, yeah. up to an aquifer. Methane, definitely. They've done yes, that. you're saying that now, but before Christmas, you were saying actually there hasn't right. been a related case, but now there is. You've suddenly got a list of yes. all these reasons why it's happened and how it's happening. It's I, I've been case. saying that for a long time. Well, I've been giving that presentation since our first well. Cynthia, so yes, I've just... I've just got an extension to this, if I just may, very quickly. So what you're saying now is that you've perfected this where you've studied the, you can study it for two, two miles down, you're saying, so you know the rock strata, you know it's safe when you do fracture it, you know what you're going into, what the structure is, how safe it is, why did you go into Blackpool then? And you caused two earthquakes. Why didn't you anticipate that if you know exactly what you're doing two miles down? What happened there then? Well, obviously, we went... We did, they spent the last eight months doing a study on that. And what if the next well does it? Because what a lot of people don't oh. realise is when you do these paths, yeah, they I, go I, under I, like spiders' legs. No, just a minute, they go I'm under like... I'm really happy is, because yes. I'm sure we won't be doing anything after that. So it's up to us to not do that. But you, if, if yeah, we but went you, out and it did fracks and, and, and cracked off earthquakes like that every time we fracked, we'd okay. be done. Right? Well, you, you would be... You shouldn't have known about that one. You shouldn't have done that one if you knew. I just interject, and I have seen plans at the back, and we're running out of time. But um, you presented yourselves as, uh, this is me, with my own question. Mm -hmm. you, you presented yourselves as this small um, uh, company that we can trust, you know, you know, you're looking and giving us all the detailed information. It takes a lot of money, and you're already financed by an equity company, um, and there would be more. Um, I my, big concern would be what it is that changes you who are saying you're responsible in something that is not responsible and not taking care and so on. And is it the pressure of profit? Mm -hmm. And I think that is something I can't see that I can put you on the spot to answer, but I don't see that you can insulate yourselves from that need for other finance. Equity companies are here today, one tomorrow, they want to put that. I, I don't think you want to comment. Yeah, well an equity company wouldn't finance development. You know, be in a, it would be in an oil company, like a large oil gas company. And I thought you were actually financed by the We, we are because we're little, but what would end up happening is somewhere along the line, they would sell, I mean, that's what they're, obviously, they're going to make money. So yes. they would say, for drillers, we will sell to whatever oil company that has lots of money that wants to develop this, mm -hmm. they're going to sell a piece of either a piece or all or whatever mm -hmm. of their, that's how they make their money. Right. Right. I mean, and, and that's, that's the way that works. I mean, it's not just us, that's just yeah. normal, normal. But it is for people being asked to trust, which is an issue. Well, one of the important things that we're trying to establish is getting it right early on. You know, by going to the most robust safety systems, working in close cooperation yeah. with the Department of Energy, HSC, um, and the BGS, to make sure that this is going to be a footprint of how we go forward from here. Personally, I'd, wish, I'd much prefer it that the government was financing it, I'm a bit disturbed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. We've got three. <laughs> <laughs> yes. May I? Three and then we're going to finish, I'm afraid. Three questions. Thank you. Back. I'm concerned there's mis-selling going on here on a number of accounts. Yeah, yeah. Um, local jobs, I was talking to the one guy who was on site for the Anna's Road site last week, and he came from Grimsby. Small point, but significant. Um, I'm worried that the HSC are not actively involved. It seems to me they're not just can't get to these meetings, they're not actively monitoring. I think they're out of the equation. They're dealing with offshore stuff, not onshore stuff. Mm. So it's important to keep saying HSC are doing this, they're out of the picture. I think it's disingenuous of Quadrilla to say that they've been doing this. This is technology that's been gone on since the 70s. It isn't. This is a new process, and they're not coming clean on that. Right. Final thing, damage was caused by like, those tremors. I was speaking to people in Ellswick last week, quite independent, one woman said, my drive dropped when that tremor hit. Another guy said, the pipe work in my garden 
broke. That house has been up for 50 years. It's no coincidence yeah. that that pack were broke when the tremor hit. Miss selling. I'm asking questions, I'm making observations. Okay, I think that's great. Uh, we'll just, just going on the HSC. Um, we speak to H the HSC at, um, mm. in the drill sites um, every week. Um, okay, I've got just two more at the back, and I'm sorry, but it's going to have to be the end. I'll just in the window, and then. <coughs> I'd just like to offer a quote from Quadrilla's own study, the geochemical study of bowling field seismicity. Page 49, the first sentence of their conclusions, and we've heard a lot of reassurances here tonight, the first sentence of the conclusion is, subsurface engineering will always involve significant uncertainty since there is limited data of processes occurring in great depth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you're All because we don't know every little... And we know, we never know every single little crack. That's said significant right. uncertainty. Right. Significant oh, uncertainty. Okay. I mean, I can, but, can but that doesn't that. mean you don't have a clue of what's going on. I mean, there are physics and engineering that, that come into effect on that. I mean, like when an airplane flies, you don't know every draft of air and what the total amount of wind is at all these different spots. But the airplane still knows what altitude it's at, what direction it's going, how fast it's going. It's not going to poison the earth, though, is it? I've set just one minute for it, and I think... It does. Coming back to the seismic activity, I read that um, the actual event occurred at quite some time after the fracking took place, so how is your early warning system going to actually help you? Because Well, that's actually what, how the early warning system works. What happens, it's called the Kaiser effect, and you see it a lot in geothermal wells, and that's where a lot of the work's been done, is in, in geothermal they have a lot of seismic activity because they pump, you know, where we might pump you know, one frack in one day, they pump more fluid than that continuously day after day after day. That's how some of the, geo the, the deep hot rock geothermal works. So they've done quite a bit of work on that. And what happens is you can see for every, you know, for every 1.5 earthquake, like the, the, earth, the second earthquake we had, for every 1.5, there's like, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it would be like 10, ones and a hundred zeros and a thousand point fives. It, that's not exactly right, but it, it, there's way more small events that you can see before there's a larger event. And, and what the, our traffic light system looks at is those little events. And the other thing that happens is, which is why the, the earthquake actually happened after we were done. So we pumped the job, 10 or 12 hours later is when the actual event happens. What happens is, is there's a, a, a stress difference in the rock, and that follows along and eventually makes it to, to the, 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 the small fault that was, that was stressed. In order to, to see that, you can see the tiny events. Like normally when you would, when you would frack, what you would expect to see during frack treatment is stuff on the Richter scale, which is like a minus two to a minus four. Okay, what that actually means, how much energy is in a, a minus two is about a gallon of milk dropping like a meter. The amount of energy that that had hitting the floor at the bottom of a well 7,000 feet away, that's what, you, we can actually monitor that, you can see that. Okay? That's what you'd expect. So if you start seeing things outside of that, then you know there's, there's something different going on. So that's when you start pulling back and say we can't frack the spot or, or something like that. So, and one of the other things that, that we're doing too is we're running much smaller jobs. Like to start back up, to be able to, to go in and, and as, as part of the uh, study, one of the other things that you do is you flow back the well, like after each frack. So normally we go in and we'll do you know, half a dozen fracks on, on the well. Like on the pre small well and that, you do a frack and then you do the next one the next day or a few days later, then you do another one a few days later, we leave all the water in there and then flow it all back at once. Well, what also helps reduce the seismicity is to relieve that pressure every time. So we do a frack, flow it back for a little while before you do the next one. And that relieves a lot of the stress that's on the rock. And you can see that on the on the microplate making the seismicity too. Thank you. The lady in the hat at the back, and okay. you are the last one, I'm sorry, but we do have to get out of the room. I live half a mile from the Hesse Bank Rig. I would like to know 
how far, in your presentation now, you've just said that you put 10 wells on that pad that is there now. How far do you go out underground? Under our houses, under our schools? I would like to know how far you go. Normally what you would try and do with the, of course these are all vertical. The wells that we're doing now are vertical. Okay. Eventually, if, if this web went into production, then you want to drill the horizontal <coughs> wall so you can drill the pads. So and that's what also controls the distance, how far the pads are. So most of the wells, like in, in the States, a similar type well would be probably around a mile, about a mile long, 5,000, anywhere from three to 10,000 feet is a, is a typical well, depending on what field it's in in different places. So that's what you're trying to do. So you can imagine if you've got a well site over here, it comes down, and a well bore comes over 5,000 feet, and you've got one over there, it comes down, comes back the other way 5,000 feet, uh, puts the, the pads two miles apart. So the so, longer you can do that horizontal piece, the less surface location. But that's 10 down. going down all different ways, isn't it? What's that? That's 10 going down from one pad all different ways, like spider's legs underground. Yeah, they don't actually go like a spider leg, they go parallel to each other. So. But, can I ask where you anticipate putting the next well in Hesketh Bank? Well, we, don't have, you, we, we don't have any plans for another well in Hesketh Bank right now. Well, so Not you're, you're only going to run that one well with 10 pads round, and you're not going to put an interconnected yeah. one like you suggested on the, the pre presentation? Because no, right now, we're just doing the exploration. Okay, so, yes, but so if, if we go if, into production... If it ever went into, one, if it ever went into production, we don't know that we'd use that pad. Uh, I mean, but I'm if you sure were to use that, like to use that pad, it's, it's already yeah, been built right. and got a well. Yeah, you spent so, a lot of money on that pad, yeah. so I would imagine you are going to use it. Well, so where would you anticipate the next normally, pad going in, in this if area, you went into production? The well, oh, that's that's the well would go east-west. East east the wells would go mm -hmm. east and west. This would be the direction we prefer for the wells to go. How far apart? <laughs> How far apart? <laughs> Probably 1,500 feet, but that, that's well, each that well. just a guess. Yeah. So the map you showed us at the beginning is quite accurate then, really? Yeah. 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 The aerial view. No, 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 no. The pads are well underground. The pads would be several miles apart, a couple miles apart. But <coughs> underground, the, the way the wells go, and what's controlled by is the stress in the rock. Mm -hmm. Like throughout, you know, everybody asks, no. how do you know which way the cracks are going, how far are they going? Well, that, that's one of the things you have to know to be able to know where you want to drill your wells. Because you want the fracks to go perpendicular to your well. So if we drill the well bore out this way, we want a frack to go this way. Okay. And, and what controls that is the stress in the, in the rock, and we can measure that. And so that's why the, the well bores tend to all go parallel to each other. So if we were trying to develop a well that went out this way, off, off a pad, the next well would have to drill down, then actually drill over, and then drill out. And then the next one goes down, and drills over, and then drills out. And so they actually go out parallel. But what, what I'm talking about is how far from that pad are you planning, if you went into production, putting another pad in Hesca Bank? How far other, are you going to go into Would probably be about at least, because we, we want to, hopefully we go at least 5,000 feet down the horizontal. And that's kind of the standard minimum distance. So if you, if you drill out 5,000 feet from here, then the next pad would be 10,000 feet away, so two miles. And, and that that's the closest that you that you really want. Right. And, and, it, I mean, and, and, and what it really depends on is the rock. You know, and how, how much water can I expect to sorry. go past my house whilst you're doing that? I, sorry, I'm I'm going to try and correct okay. your conclusion. I appreciate your concern, but you're asking hypothetical questions about the future. Well, and the water. point is well made. Be, Cynthia, can I just say that Mark Miller's own words said his short-term goal is 400 wells? Yeah, right. that, that's 400. The, the economic report that we did, that was the medium <coughs> size study, was 400 wells. We did, we did like a 200, 400, 800 well yeah. scenario, and how many jobs, and how much money, and all that. So, like the numbers that, that Paul gave, that was for the 400 wells. So, that was 40 pads. 40 well pads. 
I, I thank you ever so much for your patience, everybody. We are going to have to close this meeting. And I want to thank all speakers and my patients and my everyone who has come. feel that there is a need for this debate to go on, particularly those in the first row, there is a, 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 a sign in sheet by the, on the by the door. And this is the name, and it, it, just so we can gauge what sort of um, interest there is. And I'm sure the Paris Council will have it as nice on the agenda um, next week to see whether we want to make this one. Thank you very much. Thank you.